Welcome, fellow Starchivores, to another week with Dr. McDougall. We're very excited as usual, and I'm very thankful to have this time with Dr. McDougall. It's a, always, always an honor and a privilege to spend a few minutes with him and have him talk about issues, uh, health issues and, and anything that Dr. McDougall wants to talk about. So yeah. this week we are, he is going to be talking about chapter seven from the digestive tune-up, which is mostly talks about the liver. And for any of you that are new, that are joining us for the first time, you might want to get the uh, healthiest diet on the planet, because of course that gives you the perfect introduction to Dr. McDougall's philosophy of of how he treats um, diet-related diseases with diet. So thank you, Dr. McDougall, again for joining us. I know you are very, very busy and we're all very appreciative. So uh, thank you again. How are you doing? Well, Gustavo, thank you very much too. And everybody listening, thank you very much. Well, how am I doing? Uh, <laughs> you know, it's the end of the month, Gustavo, and I always put out uh, everything to the last. And You're right. I have to have the newsletter complete by tomorrow. Today, today. The same. Actually, today, because tomorrow. Yeah, it comes out tomorrow. And, I, and I've been working hard on it. I got permission to put that uh, Six Chicks comic strip by Ann Gibbons in with a quote from her. So that will be well worth looking at tomorrow. The If you missed the comic strip, the worldwide comic strip they did on the Starch Solution. And the uh, author, cartoonist, uh, Ann Gibbons, she wrote a nice personal note to me about the Starch Solution book and and about the cartoon she did and about the sanity she thinks she hopes the cartoon will bring showing the book, The Starch Solution. And we did that last week. So if you missed uh, the comic, just uh, catch the newsletter that comes out. It'll be the March 2017 newsletter, which comes out probably tomorrow night if all goes well. Right, right. And then I did a uh, I did a piece on the Broad Street study. I don't know that I have that here, but we sent out a, a piece on the Broad Street study. It's from New Zealand, not Australia, as I spoke spoke last week. The doctors, uh, Luke Wilson and Nicholas Wright, actually were students of mine. They came to the McDougal program in Santa Rosa many years ago, maybe five, six, seven years ago and worked as students taking care of our patients. So just brilliant young men, along with a few other people. Uh, they did something that, called the BROAD study, B-R-O-A-D, all in capitals. And I asked them, what does that stand for? And they said, they don't know. <laughs> they just put this acronym down and figured later on they'd figure out what BROAD meant. And, um, and uh, so that it means nothing, the BROAD Street study. I've kind of lost you, Gustavo. Are you still with me? Uh, hopefully, I still have you there. Yes, no? Yes, I am here, Dr. Michael. Okay, good, good, good. Thank you. Okay, so anyway, this Broad Street study, they did a study of, uh, in, in, a small, in a small town in New Zealand, and it was a randomized control trial. And what they did is they used the colored picture book, you know, the red, green, and yellow stoplights. And uh, I think they used the start solution book too. Regardless, they were very kind to give uh, credit to where the dietary teachings came from. But uh, these uh, young doctors in New Zealand, uh, they did a, a notable study and published in Nutrition and Diabetes, and it'll come out uh, in the newsletter tomorrow. It'll talk to you, you can read the study, uh, you can see a newspaper report on the study, you can see uh, also a uh, Mr. and Mrs. Vegan did a little uh, video piece on the study to help you understand the study. And uh, it's, it's an important contribution because it was done, somebody, now even though they have an attachment with me, independent, certainly done uh, more than halfway around the world. And it showed that people in a small community, which have very little convenience to uh, healthy ideas and health food stores and vegan cafes, and I doubt if they have a Whole Foods, they're pretty darn sure they don't. And to, so how just, you know, common everyday people with a, uh, not a lot of opportunities uh, for a sophisticated, say, urban uh, environment of everybody uh, exercising and trying to eat uh, uh, sushi, et cetera. You know, they don't have that advantage. They didn't in the small town New Zealand. Yet uh, still, 79% uh, of the people went to the meetings for the year. 
And the uh, average weight loss was, I believe, 11.5 kilos, which translates into a little more than 23 pounds maintained for a year. And these results are similar to the diet multiple sclerosis study we did at Oregon Health and Science University. Uh, we got a 19 pound weight loss for a year, which is about four pounds less, but we didn't focus on people who needed to lose weight like they did. You know, our focus was recruiting people with multiple sclerosis. So they started out in the areas of uh, cardiovascular disease and being overweight with uh, people more needy than ours. But we were able to show in the uh, Oregon Health and Science University diet study a uh, profound uh, drop in cholesterol, a 20-point drop in cholesterol. You can divide that by 38 to get international units. So that's about a half an international unit that we got drop in cholesterol. Plus, we got improvement in fatigue scores and inflammation markers, and as I say, about a 20-pound weight loss. So they were comparable uh, in what they looked at. They were confirmatory in their findings, as anybody would be who studied what we teach. I, you know, if it's true, it has to work every place. It works in your big city in Los Angeles and Dallas and your little towns in Shreveport. And, you know, it works every place. Uh, it works in New Zealand. It works in Russia. It works in China. Um, it works every place. So anyway, this is a, a broad study. Don't, you know, don't try and find out what broad stands for because I've already asked. We'll be out in the newsletter too. And then the you asked me how distressed I am. I have to tell you, I've been working on it for a couple of days and I'm still working on it and we'll probably get it to, uh, done. It's, it's a topic I should have never, ever even approached. It was uh, the title of the, of the uh, article is something like McDougal Care, Civilized Effective Health Care Act. This, the McDougal Care Act, it's called. And it's in opposition to the American Health Care Act by Trump and Ryan uh, versus the uh, Affordable Care Act by Obama. Uh, and what it says, you know, of course, so most of you know that my tend is strongly towards the Affordable Care Act, which is uh, universal health care. Uh, you know, that's my leaning. You can have your criticisms, whatever, but I've been in this business 50 years, and I think it's unfair, our health care system. When you can go bankrupt, I don't care, well, I don't care, you know, how, much, how wealthy you think you are. You know, one bad heart surgery uh, could cost you and your family a million or two dollars and put you in bankruptcy. And uh, you know, breast cancer or colon cancer could likewise uh, strip your savings for your kids for college and your retirement. It's an unfair healthcare system, whether you call it uh, uh, Trump Ryan Care or you call it Obamacare. It's basically not working, uh, and it's not going to work. It can't work because we're not approaching it with the same type of uh, uh, unification. Uh, uh, agreement, uh, uh, effectiveness that we should be. Uh, we should be approaching health care the same way that we approach military defense. Uh, it's it's as, as big a problem, if not as a bigger, a bigger problem in terms of political discussion these days, if not in terms of risk to our population. You see, you don't, you don't have uh, individual companies like Kaiser Permanente, IBM, Apple, General Motors, Ford Motor Company, et cetera. You don't have them uh, building armies, navies, marines, and intelligence agencies to protect uh, us as U.S. citizens against uh, foreign threats. You can't you don't do that. Uh, the government is there to protect us from foreign threats. You know what I'm talking about, uh, people from uh, other countries who have other beliefs who would just as soon live in your house. and. Uh, you know, the government's there for that, to protect us from that kind of serious threats. Well, the government should be there to protect us from domestic threats. And one of the domestic threats that we have, I mean, there are many of them, but one of them is our health care system. Uh, our health care system, even under Obamacare, encourages more pharmaceutical spending, more spending on doctors, more spending on hospitals, more spending on cancer treatments, heart surgeries, and so on. And by the way, I've told you many, many times that 
surgery, heart surgery for chronic coronary artery disease does not work. And that's a hundred billion dollar a year business in the US, probably more. Now, yeah, probably 150 billion if you include angioplasty and open heart. Hey, correct me on a few billion dollars. I don't care. Uh, diabetes is 330 billion a year. And the treatments, excluding type 1 diabetes, essentially kill people. Uh, this isn't fair. And uh, who's going to protect us against, uh, uh, you know, the big hospitals and the big doctors, the big pharmacies? And who's going to protect us? Well, you need a medical military defense is what I think. Oh, yeah, you know, you can call me a whatever in terms of political points of view, but I'm just trying to be a doctor and I'm trying to get my patients healthy and our country healthier. And you don't have to put any political bent on this at all. You can, but you can call me whatever names you want. But it's not fair that we have a healthcare system that's allowed to sell you chemotherapies. I'll show you an article where of the 32 chemotherapies commonly used, 16 of them have not been proved to show any benefit in survival. I've talked to you many times about screening programs. No screening program, not mammography, colonoscopies, PSA testing, even uh, fecal for blood and sigmoids, which I recommend. None of these screening procedures have ever uh, increased or decreased overall mortality. They may decrease disease-specific mortality, like you have less chance of dying of colon cancer, but in the process of testing and treating you, they kill you. So overall, uh, mortality is not changed by these screening programs. So who's going to protect us from uh, the heart surgeons and the drug companies selling these uh, dangerous, uh, ineffective diabetic drugs and uh, the cancer chemotherapy uh, business and uh, you know, and you know the supplement industry and uh, the screening industries. Who's going to protect us? You need a medical military army to do this because, because as proof and evidence, Kaiser hasn't done it. Apple Computer hasn't done it. IBM hasn't done it. You know, so if it could be done, you'd have done it. You can't. So let's just forget it. Let's get on to. What we need is what we need is we need a government that protect, protects us from domestic threats, which are the medical industries that I just mentioned. And also, the, the government needs to protect us from the architects of common diseases. The architects of common diseases are big food. You know, we're, we're talking about the dairy and the meat industries, the junk food industries, and the sugar industries. You know, if you, Kaiser Permanente, if you Blue Cross Blue Shield of whatever, if you, uh, you know, whatever company you are, whatever uh, organization you are, if you could have done it, if you could have stopped big food, which is causing about two thirds of our illnesses, if you could have stopped them, you would have and you didn't. So we need something else. And so, you know, as uh, un American as it may sound to many of you who are hardcore capitalists, which I'm not going to get into. You know, maybe I sound un American to you. Maybe I sound like a bad person. But my intention is simply to protect. I took an oath to protect my. When I, I finished medical school, I raised my right hand and I swore I'd protect my patients. And so did you if you're a physician or many other uh, organizations. And our pay patients are not being protected. So, anyways, I'm trying to write an article called. Uh, uh, McDougal Care, uh, the uh, civilized, ethical, effective health care act, as opposed to the American Health Care Act and the Affordable Care Act. We're going to have the McDougal Health Care Act, and uh, that's what I'm writing about. And it's fun, but I feel like I'm a little bit out of my area of expertise because I don't know the law and the legislation. And I'm going to get a lot of criticism from people about increased taxation and you're acting like a socialist and, uh, you know, we shouldn't be taking care of poor people. They're not worth the trouble or poor people are, are, are too stupid to take care of themselves and all kinds of other things are going to be said to me about what I believe not to be true. But too bad. <laughs> You've never seen me hold back before. And so anyway, I'm, I'm trying to get through this article in a way that I don't embarrass myself by people saying that, uh, 
you know, his, his intentions are political and his knowledge of the problems are inadequate. You know, number one is not true. And number two, two is true. I do need to know more. But, you know, I've been a doctor for half a century and I've seen people lose their fortunes. And I've seen the horrible things done with good intentions by doctors, pharmaceutical companies, hospitals, et cetera. I've seen that over half a century. So I deserve the right to tell you how I feel. And if you want to come back with your criticisms, I've already, I've already thought about them. I've already considered them. But I'm still going to try and get the news that are done today and get it out to you tomorrow. So you ask me how I am, Gustavo, just stressed as I always am at the end of the month. <laughs> Let me no, just talk about a we, are, we, are, we are, I think we're all waiting, you know, impatiently to hear your, to, to read your newsletter. I'm sure it's going to be very good. And like you said, all you want is to take care of your patients. You well, know, what it comes down to is this. Uh, it's uh, those people who are healthy right now don't want to pay for those people who are sick. And I understand, you know, I... I'm in good health. I, I feel uh, right, right. somewhat resentful that I have to pay for somebody who's on sure. a dialysis machine because, you know, they ate too many pigs and cows and lost their kidney function. And I feel a little resentful. I can understand that. You know, I don't need health care. They do. That's one of the problems. But it's not morally right. I shouldn't feel that way. And I know I, I know I could I could have better thinking. And the other thing, uh, the other thing it's based on is the wealthy just don't want to help the poor. Well, let's face it. You know, the top 1% or 10% or whatever you want, they want to keep their money. And I understand that, you know, I mean, you know, but I mean, enough's enough. I mean, once you get enough to pay for your your car and your vacations, your family, and your education, you know, what are you going to do with that extra $25 billion? You know, it's just going to sit in the bank, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's just- Someone money. else will enjoy it for you. You'll lose it tomorrow. <laughs> anyway, I think, I think those are the motivations of- of uh, being selfish and not want to help those who are sick and being selfish and not want to help the poor are wrong. And I'll tell you something else they tell me, Gustavo, is they tell me, well, they really tell me that, you know, you can help well-educated, intelligent, wealthy people because they really care. You know, they're going to make these changes and say to themselves, well, you know, that's not been my experience, especially. Maybe there is an edge for people who have a better education and, and uh, more access to information and are burdened all day long by just trying to uh, earn enough money to pay the rent and to and to keep the kids from being hungry. Yeah, there may be some advantage there, but you know, poor people care too. Uh, we've had a chance, one directing myself, to work at the Sacramento Food Bank uh, with Don Forrester and Jeff Nelson. And a second experience that was done without me, but was done with you know my uh, outside aid by Don Forrester and Jeff Nelson at the Baptist uh, Church in Oakland. I mean, these people are very, I mean, how, you know, they, they're, you know, they're very poor. Most of them don't have jobs. They're just trying to get by. And we took care of these two groups of people who some people would predict they're, they're too stupid and too disinterested. And I hope you get this, my sarcasm there to take care of themselves. You know, what we found is that these people were uh, as compliant, got as great as results as the, as the wealthiest people I've ever taken care of. And I've taken care of billionaires, let me tell you. So don't give me that excuse that, you know, the poor people, uh, less fortunate people don't deserve the help of the more fortunate because they're not going to take advantage of it anyways. They are too. You know, the people care about their children and their husbands and their wives and having a good day uh, out at the park and, and not being sick and being able to go to work. I don't care what income or educational level you're at. So... Now I better go on. Well done. Well said, Dr. McDougall. I think you have a lot of people here that are ready to vote for you. Well, yeah. I mean, when I get to be Surgeon General, right. Uh, one article that came out disturbed a lot of people this week, and, and I'll just show you from our paper. If I can read it, it's from the desk, Press Democrat. I don't know whether you're going to see it or not. But let me give you the gist of it. And it bothered a lot of people. It, uh, the title is DNA Errors Responsible for Most Cancers. And I pulled out the paper. And it's from science. Of course, got a lot of attention, a lot of respect. And uh, here's the paper right here. Uh, you can look it up. It's probably copyrighted, so I'm not going to give it to you. Okay. Uh, that's the paper right there. And uh, so that what they're telling the public is, look, don't worry about uh, smoking and being exposed to the uh, pollutants from the smokestack upwind from you. And don't worry about eating the, the bacon and the eggs and the, and the chicken and 
and polluted fish and so on. Don't worry about that because it's all in your genes. You can't help yourself. And so that hit, hit, hit worldwide headlines. And that's just plain and simple not true. I sent you a few slides, and I don't know whether they'd be easy to, for you to throw up. If they are, <clears throat> Gustavo, you can do it. I mean, look at the incidence of cancers worldwide if Gustavo can get these. I think I gave you three or four slides. <clears throat> And uh, the darker areas, if we can get them up in the world map, are the ones with the most cancers of the breast and the prostate and the colon. And what you'll see is that uh, these cancers are in wealthy countries like the US, like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and now China and uh, wherever you look. I mean, so, so uh, you know, if it's due to genes, are, are Asian people that genetically different than uh, uh, white people or black people? I don't think so. And uh, why is it that uh, these uh, diseases in countries uh, which populate Asian people like Japan and Thailand and Cambodia and so on, why are the incidence of these cancers skyrocketing if it's all genetic? It's because they change their food. Well, folks, don't let these articles like this disturb you when they come out and they say, oh, no, there's nothing you can do about it. It's all in your genes. And by the way, we're going to develop a genetic test and some uh, special tweezers to go in and manipulate your genes so we can fix all this so you continue to eat your double Whopper cheeseburgers. Anyway, well, you don't have to get them up if, you, if it doesn't work out there, Gustavo. Let's see what we got. Well, don't quite see it yet. So uh, if it goes up, fine. If it doesn't go up, fine. Uh, anyway, you get my point is that, that uh, again, the media has done you a serious disservice. Uh, even if it is genetic, you can't do anything about it. And by the way, I've been in this business a half a century, and they've been telling me uh, for a half a century that it's going to be genes that are going to turn this disease problem around. And I can't think maybe there's some real, uh, 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 real unusual disease, orphan disease, as we call them. Uh, I, that I could probably think of that's been helped by genetics. But otherwise, I can't think of any, any major health problem, obesity, heart disease, breast cancer, prostate cancer, any health problem that's been helped by genetic manipulation, genetic study, et cetera. Do you see the slide up, uh, Gustavo? Because I just see a black screen. So, Gustavo, you still with me? So oh, let's see, Gustavo, can I get you back? If not, then I will try and log back in. So I'll just give you a second here, Gustavo, to uh, get us back online. And for those folks that can hear me right now, you know, no, I guess you can't. So nobody can hear me, nobody can see me. I'm going to have to do all this and get back online. So just everybody be patient, and we will try again. Right. Okay, Gustavo, do I have you back? Well, Gustavo, I'm going to try again to get you, because all I get up is a black screen and uh, it's just not working out here. So let me uh, cancel out again and try it. Am I still on, Mary, or not? 
Well, you know, I can't hear Gustavo and uh, uh, the, okay, well, you know, I'm there. So folks, please be patient. I'm there. I'm going to try and blow the log back in and see if we can get this going. Well, Mary, can you call Gustavo and ask him what he'd like to do? Oh, sure. So anyway, I understand that I'm still on. So let me uh, talk to you about a few things. Uh, and, and we'll see if we can get this resolved with Gustavo. Uh, last time I talked to you about um, Okay, thanks. I, I see you know you're hearing me just fine. So I'll continue on and we'll see if we can get Gustavo back on with us. Uh, last week I talked to you about uh, uh, eating a uh, high fat diet causes uh, diarrhea. And uh, this is one of the common things that I see in my practice. And we were talking about GI disease. This is what our uh, link is this month is about GI disease. And I just wanted to show you the article that was published in 1974. 1974, I mean, count the number of decades ago that was <clears throat> uh, in nutrition metabolism. And I'm going to show you the article so that you can, if you want, you can uh, you know, look it up and find it someplace. Okay, there it is, nutrition. Okay, it's by Anderson. And it was published, and it showed that it's titled A Fat-Reduced Diet and Symptomatic Treatment of Patients with Ileopathy. Uh, those slides uh, show that worldwide, when you look at incidence of cancer, the prostate, breast, colon, et cetera, there are exceptions. There are some cancers that are, occur more commonly in, in uh, uh, rural, underdeveloped countries. But most of the cancers, like uh, breast, colon, and prostate, the ones, you know, even the lymphomas and leukemias, uh, most cancers are uh, concentrated in uh, wealthy countries like the Canada, the United States, New Zealand, Australia, now India, and China. These are not genetic diseases. You may have genetic tendencies, but your DNA is uh, just fine. If you didn't eat the rich Western diet and you weren't exposed to common carcinogens uh, from the pollution of our factories, even if you have a tendency to get cancer, you know the risk would probably be uh, one in 5,000 or less just like it is for other genetic diseases. True genetic diseases, the chance of getting is like one in 5,000 people. You know, your chance of getting a major organ fatal, potentially fatal cancer is one out of three. One out of three people will get a, a, a potentially fatal cancer. And true genetic diseases are one in 5,000. So yeah, you may have a genetic tendency, but if you don't bring that tendency out by eating healthy food, you're going to be just fine and don't smoke and don't get too much sun, etc. All right. And then I started to talk to you about something. We were going to go into the cold. Well, let me do something else. Uh, anyway, endometriosis is a dietary disease. There's a lot of scar tissue left over, uh, a lot of inflammation. So it may not work out as well as you'd like. But we talked about that. Then the other thing we talked about last time, and I wanted to show you the papers, uh, we talked about uh, how uh, the American diet, particularly the oil, like vegetable oil, pig fat, cow fat, and so on, it causes diarrhea. And the reason it causes diarrhea, as we talked about last week, is because fat causes the liver to produce more bile acids. And those bile acids in some people aren't absorbed properly back in the small intestine. They go into the large intestine. They give them profuse diarrhea. I mean, they'll have, you know, 20 watery stools a day. They can't go anything, any place but the bathroom. And what I, what I was trying to explain to you last week when we talked about GI diseases is that uh, this is a common problem. Medical students are never taught the cause and solution. And so people continue to go on suffering, and they've never taught this, never taught this. I, I see medical students all the time. They come to my, have you ever heard of this? I say this article. 
by Anderson, and here it is right here. So you can, you know, look at it and find it and so on. Yeah, that's the article. And that was published in 1974, where he took uh, the patients with severe 20 stools a day, diarrhea, put them on a low-fat diet, essentially cured them all. Uh, in in a, a day or two or three, they were having a couple form stools a day. Here's the paper right here. And it's totally ignored because it doesn't sell a drug. Anyway, here's another paper by Andres Anderson, uh, mm -hmm. Henrik Anderson on uh, uh, stones made of uh, oxalate that are likewise caused by high fat diet. And the same discussion about how fat interferes with uh, bile acid absorption and so on. So anyway, we talked about those. Uh, I just wanted to bring you up on those from last week. And then this week, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the liver from this book. This book, remember, I wrote this more than a decade ago. Yeah, that's the book. Still <laughs> sold. Uh, it's, a, it's a big seller for the company that published it. And uh, uh, you could buy it in Amazon or any bookstore or uh, Whole Foods carries these quite often. It's called Dr. McDougall's Digestive Tune-Up. Not crazy about the title, but hey, you know, it's, it's fortunate one of the few things that I think I could have done a better job on was the title of the book. <clears throat> but in this book, uh, we talked about gallbladder disease last week. We talked about uh, how you get gallstones and what the fact is you shouldn't be taking asymptomatic gallstones out. And then I was going to talk to you a little bit about the liver this week. And uh, don't put that slide up now. No, I won't. <laughs> We're going to lose our audience forever. <laughs> but anyway, I was going to talk to you a little bit about the liver. And the, the picture Gustavo was going to show was this one right here, which is in the book. And you can see the liver there. We showed it last week. But anyway, uh, the liver is a, a great filter of the body. It also produces bile acids. And one of the biggest problems today is uh, called fatty infiltration of the liver. It's not due to alcoholism. It's due to eating fat, like cow fat, and pig fat, and olive fat, and corn fat, and that kind of fat. What happens is you get fat on the outside. You can see this in your belly, and your, in your legs, and in your butt, and so on, buttocks. You know, you can see all this, but inside, you know, all this fat's collecting around your heart and your intestines. And it's also going into your liver. And you get what we call fatty infiltration of the liver. And this fatty infiltration of the liver uh, causes inflammation of the liver. And I see it, boy, I'll see it. If, say I take care of 40 or 50 people during a typical program, I'll see it in maybe three, four of the patients. And it's fatty infiltration of the liver. And I see it by elevated liver en enzymes called the uh, SGOT and SGPT are also called ALT and AST, whatever. Those are the abbreviations. You can look it up. <clears throat> but you'll, that's what you'll see on your uh, blood test, your general chemical test, is these tests are elevated. They show inflammation of something. And in most cases, it's the liver. And this inflammation of the liver, they say, I haven't seen it, but I have every reason to believe it's true, will go on to cirrhosis of the liver that can be fatal. And, uh, you know, they talk today in newspaper articles I've seen and in medical journal articles that uh, this fatty infiltration of the liver due to eating the Western diet <coughs> is uh, a more uh, is the most serious of all liver problems, more than alcoholism. And it's basically 100% fixable by losing weight by any means, you know, going on the Atkins diet, having bariatric surgery, starving yourself. If you get that fat out of the liver, then this inflammation stops. But the healthiest, most permanent, uh, most delicious way to lose the weight is to eat the kind of starch-based diet that I've been talking to you about. Uh, the other couple of things I want to mention about the liver is alcohol is a big deal. And, uh, you know, we don't, we're not a drug rehab program. And we make that clear when people come to the 10-day program. We don't ask people to stop coffee. We don't ask them to stop alcohol. Uh, we're, we're a food rehabilitation program. But alcohol is a big deal as far as causing inflammation. Also, there's a lot of in, infection problems uh, of the liver called hepatitis. There's hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and probably a few other uh, <laughs> letters go along with the different hepatitises. 
they're, they used to be called non-A, non-B hepatitis. So, but we identify them as A, B, and C these days. Now, A is usually caused by transmission of, uh, say, feces. Uh, it's oral transmission. Uh, B is usually by uh, more intimate contact, such as sexual activity, tattoos, blood transfusions, uh, uh, drug, heroin type abuse type things. You get more common infection with B. And likewise, C is most common through uh, IV transmissions, like blood transmissions and also uh, uh, transmissions by using, let's just call them illicit drugs. Uh, unfortunately, these uh, infections are uh, can be fatal. Uh, we have some drugs that treat them, especially uh, type C. It costs about $100,000 for the treatment. So save your money. Uh, but they do work, and you should look into them if you have these kinds of infections. Uh, I have also seen a couple of times, you know, just because I've seen it doesn't mean it's true, but I've seen it a few times that people who've had chronic hepatitis B and C, who changed their diet, who all evidence of the hepatitis went away after years of suffering from chronic hepatitis. Now, it just may have been coincidence. It could be because they're healthier, they were now better able to fight the virus. So that's another possibility. And then the third thing I wanna tell you about the liver before I move on with questions, is there's autoimmune diseases of the liver, like the liver bile ducts. Uh, there's uh, cholangitis, autoimmune cholangitis, where your bile ducts are being attacked. And you don't know why, but the doctor says it's an autoimmune disease, you're going into liver failure, you're dying. Well, like most autoimmune diseases, uh, uh, food would be the primary suspect of causing the body to make antibodies against your bile ducts, you know, your liver ducts. And I, again, have treated several people in the past who've had uh, uh, disease that was approaching, you know, risk of their life. Uh, that was uh, auto, an autoimmune uh, cholangitis. Uh, and uh, as, uh, you know, they changed their diet and whatever, maybe by coincidence. But what I want to do tell you folks is, you know, I'm not trying to say that uh, these conditions like infection and autoimmune had been proved to be solved by a good diet. But what do you got to lose? Oh, what's it going to cost you to eat well? You know, what risks are there? And, you, and regardless of what's wrong with you, you, you need to eat as healthy as possible. So don't take my suggestion lightly if you have a disease that's, quote, not due to virus, not, not due to diet, it's due to virus, or we don't know what's caused it, you know, the body's tagging itself, or, uh, uh, you know, whatever. You know, fix the food, because you can always fix that and see what happens. You might be surprised. That's right. Uh, yeah. So anyway, that's pro probably... Uh, all I have to say about the liver of this, and okay. if you have some questions about the liver, and maybe we can go on to a couple other questions. Well, the, I know one of the questions that comes up very often is what you just talked about, that will be people call fatty liver. And, the, and then on page 65, 66 in your book, you talk about herbs for hepat hepatitis, and yes, people want to know a little bit more about that, if you don't mind. Well, there was an article published in The Lancet. Now, you know, you're stretching me a little bit, Gustavo, in my memory. Okay. There was an article published in The Lancet many years ago, and it's referenced in the book, on, uh, on an herbal preparation that was given to people with type B hepatitis. And, you know, uh, you'll have to look up the article, but, uh, but I believe it was uh, about a 60% uh, remission rate as far as antibodies using this, uh, this particular herb. And it's been published several times. Uh, the herbal treatment of uh, viral hepatitis. And all you have to do is go to the internet or the National Library of Medicine, which is www.pubmed.gov and put in the terms uh, uh, herbal preparations or herbs and uh, hepatitis. And you will find a couple of studies. And the one from the Lancet, of course, is, is a really important study. So, uh, yeah, that would be something. Let's see if I can find That's probably not important. You can, you can find it in the book, uh, Herbs for Hepatitis. Here it is, a section called. For example, one of the earliest and most encouraging reports was published in 1988 in the Lancet Medical Journal. In this uh, uh, 
preliminary study, 37 chronically infected patients were treated with a preparation of plant, and I'm not going to say what the herb is, I can't, uh, if you'll excuse me, I'll try it, uh, Philantus Amoris, P-H-Y-L-L-A-N-T-H-U-S, Amoris, A-M-A-R-U-S, for 30 days. And uh, when tested 15 to 20 days following the treatment, 22 of the 36 patients, in other words, 59%, not a bad memory, huh? 59% had lost the hepatitis B surface antigen, uh, which means essentially they were cured. But again, this is this is published in the Lancet, the best medical journal in the world, in my opinion, one of the best. But it's uh, of no value because who's going to push it? I mean, where's the money to be made? Right, uh, exactly. Whether it works or not. Uh, I mean, what do you got to lose by trying this herbal preparation? I'm sure it doesn't cost much. And I have, uh, in this preparation uh, article, I remember it said one notable thing is it had uh, no risk of toxicity to do this. Right. So anyway, right. you can also find this, if you want the reference, you can find it in my June 2002 newsletter on the liver. That reference oh, uh, from the Lancet is there. My June two, That's on my website, my June 2002 newsletter. So you can look it up, think about it, take it to your doctor, and so on. And uh, that may be, uh, well, certainly it's not yeah. going to be any harm. Have you ever heard of a herb someone is asking called uh, Golden Seal? Oh, I have heard you... of them too. Uh, okay. They call this fat, uh, fatty infiltration of the liver non-alcoholic uh, steratohepatitis. Yes. Steratohepatitis. So I think the abbreviation is N-A-S-H. If you're looking for fatty infiltration of the liver, that's kind of the new term. Yeah, I've, I've heard of gold, would you ask golden seal? Right, right. I've have you ever of... had any patients use it or anything? I have, I see people. Because I see a lot of people. I mean, I've, I've seen personally more than 10,000 people. Right. And I've taken care of more than 16,000 personally, myself. Yes. Almost every time, all by myself, with, with the help of my my staff. Uh, and I, I want to tell you, I'd like to have seen a different Gustavo. I really would because they're inexpensive, self-administered, relatively non-toxic. I'd like to be able to sit here and say to you, that uh, herbal preparations that I've seen my patients use have just made a overnight phenomenal difference in their health, but I can't because I haven't. You know, saw Paul Meadow people say, well, it helps them with their depression. Right. Well, that, that's for the prostate. Uh, St. John's warts for depression. Saw Paul Meadow's for the prostate. Uh, St. John's warts for depression. You know, uh, uh, all, all kinds of, uh, uh, of, you know, roots and, uh, different herbal preparations people have come to me haven't taken and I asked them with the hopes of hearing some really good news well did that make a difference and I have to tell you my clinical experience is I can't remember anybody who right. said you know I, I took this herbal preparation and boy I lost 60 pounds my type 2 diabetes went away I have a great bowel movement every day I, I have no indigestion I was able to, able to throw away my proton pump inhibitors, all my blood pressure pills, all my diabetic pills, uh, all my type 2 uh, diabetes insulin. I've never seen that. But, you know, Gustavo, I see it every day. And I don't talk about once a day. I'm talking about many times a day. If I take care of 50 patients at a 10-day program, uh -huh. I, I hear stories like that and better from well over half those people. All the time, yes. All, I mean, it's what's expected. So if I had an herb that would give me even a hundredth of those kinds of results, well, I'd be selling it, and you and I <laughs> wouldn't be here talking. I'd be out on my $4.3 million sailboat. That's right. around the Pacific, uh, <laughs> sipping iced teas with Mary. No, I wouldn't really, because I really love what I'm doing. So even if I, even if I made like a $50 billion selling you an herb, which, by the way, if we could just sell you the food and you'd buy it, I'd have the $50 billion, but you won't. You want a pill instead. So here That's I am right. sitting here poor. <laughs> no, I don't, 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 don't believe that. No, no. <laughs> all right. Point. I know, do. If I, if, if I can put potatoes and rice and corn in a, in a pill and sell it to you as an herbal capsule or some pharmaceutical-related oh, drug, yeah. I, I'd be so rich I could have Bill Gates clean my bathrooms. Sure. <laughs>
<laughs> well, yeah, people want the magic pill, that's for sure. You know what? But, but unfortunately, the magic pill, unfortunately, it's there, but it's like uh, two to five pounds of food a day. Yeah. And you have to boil the potatoes, and, you know, it takes a little bit of work, but the, the exact pill you're looking for is there. Uh, Dr. McDougall, uh, there's someone who is asking, what if, you've had, what if you have had your gallbladder out? Is there anything beyond the diet that you can do? Very much so, because half the people who have their gallbladder outs are still sick. Right. And they're sick because the gallbladder wasn't really the problem or there were additional problems related to what you eat. So if you have your gallbladder out and you're still in pain, well, why don't you try to change your diet, which was probably the original cause anyways. So uh, yes, you're going to change your diet. Secondarily, when you've had your gallbladder out, as we talked about last week, you don't have that storage sac for the bile acids. So you have a constant drip of bile acids into your intestines. So one of the most common complaints that people have had their gallbladder out is they have chronic diarrhea. And the way you stop that is you eat a low fat diet because fat stimulates bile acid production and you eat a high fiber diet because the fiber combines with the bile acids and neutralizes them. And you can cure the diarrhea just like I talked about with other chronic diarrhea states. Chronic diarrhea secondary to gallbladder removal is almost always cured with a low fat mm -hmm. diet. But again, occasionally I'll add a uh, <clears throat> bile acid sequestering agent. I'll say that again, bile acid sequestering agent. Uh, like Questran or Cholestid. Cholestyramine is another, is the generic name. And you buy it from the pharmacy in pills and it doesn't go into the body, it just stays in the gut and it binds the bile acids. So say I have a patient who's doing, you know, pretty good or maybe not so good following the diet, but, but they're, they're worried about diarrhea for one reason or another. And say they have to play and take an air, airplane trip and they're gonna be an airplane for mm. you know, four to 12 hours and they're worried that they're gonna be in distress, I will give them these uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agent pills. They could also can come in powders. They come in pills and I'll have them take a couple of them, uh, maybe the day before they travel or the day they travel and maybe you know a couple other times. And that stops the diarrhea for them and then they get on the plane and just go fine. They do fine. Oh, okay. Yeah. You don't wanna lose your gallbladder. And I'll tell you another reason you don't wanna use your gallbladder. Your gallbladder is sitting there screaming at you. I had a neighbor who had uh, uh, my, uh, my next door neighbor in Hawaii. She had gallbladder attacks all the time. She'd go to the doctor and she'd ask me, because I was also her doctor, she'd say, should I have my gallbladder out? And I'd say, no, just eat right. Every time you have an attack, it's, it's, uh, it was preceded by a greasy dinner that you made at home or at a restaurant. I said, that gallbladder is there to warn you that you're eating bad food, it could save your life. It's screaming at you, don't eat this food, you'll get a stroke or a heart attack or breast cancer. So you take that gallbladder away, you don't have that warning system. Uh, uh, I mean, and if you eat good, like when she did, if she ate well, she never had an attack. So the gallbladder could be a great stimulus to keep you on track. Right. But you know, sometimes it just hurts and sometimes eating you know, a low fat diet doesn't solve it. And sometimes there are other reasons. And doctors are really good at taking gallbladders out. Right? Oh you know, yes. Yeah. Yeah. When we change right. from the system of doing a nine inch slash under your right rib cage to one where we just put a couple of holes in your stomach with a laparoscopy, the instant uh -huh. gallbladder surgery went up four hundred percent. Oh yeah. Because of the sure. ease of doing it. Right. And also the money made. <laughs> And the money that is made. Dr. McDougall, someone says that they don't have a bladder for about five years and um, that the, their cholesterol levels are climbing. Is that related to not having a gallbladder? No, I don't think uh, not having a gallbladder has anything to do with your cholesterol climbing. But people hmm. who eat a high cholesterol diet, and cholesterol, of course, is only found essentially to any amount in animal foods. So when you eat a high cholesterol diet, you supersaturate your bile with cholesterol, which is the hallmark of gallstones. They're made of cholesterol. So, uh, you know, just the kind of diet you're eating not only gives you supersaturated bile, which gives you gallstones, but gives you a high blood cholesterol. And you may have a tendency towards high cholesterol just because of genetic tendencies, family tendencies, et cetera. 
which would tend towards supersaturation of bile with, with cholesterol. Or another problem is you may be one of those mistaken vegans, vegetarians that think the answer to your heart problems and health problems, which they, you know was common knowledge, et cetera, everybody knew in the 1970s, the problem was animal fat and you could solve it by giving vegetable oils like corn oil and safflower oil. Well, in the studies done, <clears throat> they got lower blood cholesterols. But when they started following them up later by using these vegetable oils, they had worse arteries, more heart disease, more cancer, and more gallbladder disease from using these vegetable oils than they did from using animal fat. So right. uh, just one more thing about those of you who are trying to solve your health problems. Don't do it by switching to these uh, food poisons like olive oil, corn oil, safflower oil, canola oil, et cetera. You're just asking for all kinds of trouble. Right. Dr. Majoral, you talk in, your, in chapter 7 here that the liver is in charge of uh, regulating cholesterol levels, right? Am I well, it, yeah, it has a lot to do with it. It's what uh, statins are based on are inhibiting an, a liver en enzyme. Right. Uh, okay, so what the people here, have, quite, a, quite a lot of people here are having questions about why uh, their cholesterol levels are are still high, even though they're eating. Well, you know, first of all, first of all, I, I have to say, as I always have in the past, hoping not uh -huh. to offend anybody, right. is that sometimes people don't tell the truth to themselves and to others. You know, uh, sometimes people really aren't eating as strictly as they should. You know. They don't count the Chinese restaurant that they went out to yesterday or the Indian restaurant they went out to three days ago or the, you know, uh, you know, two pats of butter they put on their broccoli. It wasn't that big a deal. And so they're really not being honest about it. That's one thing. Uh, number two is many people can't lower their cholesterol uh, much, as much as they would with a diet. I take care of people who start out with cholesterols of, say, 280 and they drop their cholesterol level of 200, and they say, well, it's still not good enough. 150 is supposed to be ideal. So I'm a fay, or I'm a fay, or well, you dropped your cholesterol 80 points. That's like a 500% decrease, of more than a 500% decrease in your risk of dying of heart disease. Just that relative drop of, uh, of uh, 80 points, actually, it's a 60-point drop in cholesterol that that translates into, uh, uh, which is a five-fold decrease in your risk of dying of heart disease. So even though you didn't hit, quote, the perfect ideal of 150, which, is, by the way, I think I invented, and lots of people have taken over <laughs> as an ideal, but I didn't mean to do it. I didn't no. mean to make that your goal exactly. I just kind of threw it out there as something you might want to use as reference, and it's caused all kinds of problems. You're not a bad person if you can't get your cholesterol to 150. So many exactly. people can't drop it as low as they would like. And then you have to get to the question, would I be better off, would I do myself more good than harm if I took a statin to make the numbers better? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a doctor. I can make your blood cholesterol level one international unit. I can make it 40 milligrams per deciliter. I'm a doctor. I got pills that will do that. You know, then you have to ask yourself, well, are the pills going to do me more good than harm? And I would refer you to my May 2013 newsletter for a review on who should take statins. And now there are some new cholesterol lowering drugs out, which cost about $12,000 a year, which work different than statins, which are gonna be very popular. Why are they gonna be popular? Because the insurance companies will pay for them. But under McDougal Care, the new civilized, effective healthcare act we're not going to buy these very expensive drugs for you unless they're the absolute last resort. And the drug companies aren't going to get away with selling you medicine that costs $12,000 a year for treating cholesterol that should, never should be treated by drugs. Right. Always right. should be treated by diet. So when the McDougal <laughs> Care Healthcare Act comes in, <laughs> oh, I'm going to get a lot of heat when this news comes Oh, you out. are. You are. Well, it'll be. Uh, but you, you, you must do it, Dr. Michael. It's something that you, you have something to say that is very important. Well, you know, Gustavo, uh, uh, as I said, I've done this for 50 years. I, I, That's right. I have an opinion that's deserved being heard. Uh, yes. I, I, I don't mind being corrected. 
on details, especially overall concepts. I think it would bother me if you flawed my overall concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, that would uh, make me question you know, my own abilities. Yes. If you want to flaw me on some details here or things or that I left out, I, I can live with that. But I, I think you'll find what I write in the next newsletter of, uh, of general interest. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. Right now, what's going on is a <laughs> complete failure as our new administration says, Healthcare is a complete failure, yet when it's come up for referendum, which it did last week, didn't seem to be that big a failure, did it? Mm -hmm. and exactly. The American Healthcare Act failed miserably, and the Obamacare Affordable Care ha Act persisted. So I'd have to say there's some disagreement as to what's going on and what the success are. And so I'm just going to go a few step further and offend of people who are strong promoters of Obamacare, which by the way is my tendency. And uh, I offend people who are, are strong supporters of Trump Ryan care. I'm going to make you all mad. Right. right. Well, that's okay. <laughs> you, you bring that uh, excitement in our lives. So we are excited. By the way, everybody, you've got to sign up for Dr. McDougall's newsletter, and you can do that on his website. It's free. Well, Gustavo, you've been through this. You know, I'm not going to share your I, personal histories, but you know, you've been through this with family members and have seen oh, yeah. what it has cost uh, for people when they get old and debilitated, and hurt and sick, and the litigation that goes on afterwards. And you know, I mean, it is really not fair. It's not fair to have a healthcare system where when you've worked your whole life to save for your kid's tuition, to save your retirement, can bankrupt you and does every day to thousands of people. Without, yes. Every day to thousands of people it bankrupts them with one single illness. Mm -hmm. and you spend 50 years saving up for whatever and you get a heart attack or not even a heart attack, somebody just finds you have some blocked arteries. That's right. Which, yeah, that's right. Which they go looking for. And they end right. up, uh, they end up hurting you or killing you. They've just taken everything away from you and your spouse and your kids and and maybe your favorite charity like Dr. McDougall's uh, Health and Medical Foundation. That's right. <laughs> you know, the five hundred one C three you want to give your money to so we can do more research. Exactly, I love that. It's a wonderful organization. Dr. Uh, Michael. You know, uh, we're gonna have we're gonna have a lot to say later about that over the next. Uh, let me months. ask you a quick question here because uh, there are several people that are uh, begging me to ask you this question, and uh, you've talked about this a few times. So if you don't mind saying it again, um, how about people are saying that they they notice that their hair is thinning when they start a low fat plant-based diet, is there anything we do with the thyroid or the liver or anything okay. else, or is it we're getting older, or what is it? Well, I, I think most of this is based on our previous teachings, our previous bias. Uh, we're taught that to, to have strong hair, strong everything, bones, strong fingernails, strong muscles, that we're supposed to eat meat and dairy. This, these are These are just uh, public relation, publicizing messages from the meat and dairy industry. So you already know, and so do all your friends, that if you go on the diet that I recommend, you'll become calcium and protein deficient, which as you well know, is uh, completely untrue. It's never occurred ever. So you know, I think most of the time when people say that there's uh, problems with their fingernails, and they tell me that sometimes, and their hair, uh, it's just a coincidence. It has nothing to do with their diet. But I do know that a low-fat diet, the uh, level of fat that I recommend, which is no added fat, which is about 7% of the calories is fat, and can get down as low as 3% of the calories is fat. I do know that low of fat intake will cause you to have drier skin. And it can be troublesome for some people. They will say, my skin's just too dry. I mean, it's very rare, but I will tell you, they'll say that. And so if you add fat, you can do this experiment yourself. If you're eating a very low fat diet right now, uh, just go to the store and buy yourself a couple of, of, of bottles of planters peanuts or your favorite cashews uh, or your favorite tahini spread, in a big bottle, and, and, and just eat it right now and see what happens to your skin tomorrow. 
it will be uh, 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 less dry, uh, maybe more soft, you describe it, but it'll really contain a lot more fat. And your hair will be oily and your skin will be oily and oily hair and oily fat are not desirable uh, qualities. So uh, I would treat dry skin with that approach. And it's not going to happen very often, again, or nail problems, etc. I wouldn't treat it with that uh, uh, approach. I would treat dry skin by topically applying various lotions. And as we've discussed before, and I haven't looked it up, these lotions are absorbed. Somebody has told me they were absorbed a lot and could contribute to obesity, but I haven't looked it up, so we're not, not going to go there right now. And uh, you can also do things for your nails, like uh, uh, one particular very helpful thing is to take a, uh, a cuticle brush, you know, those, uh, those and, and brush your cuticles every day uh, to, because the nails grow from the bed. And if you brush them every day with a cuticle brush, <clears throat> Uh, what happens you get good circulation in the nail beds and you'll grow much better fingernails now whether or not adding fat in the form of dietary fat would make the fingernails i don't know what less people talk about lines in them and all kinds of things i don't know that that'd be true or not i haven't seen any evidence that it is all so, right uh, you shouldn't have a problem with this low fat of diet if you do oil your skin from the outside with a minimal amount of the healthiest oil possible. And I can't tell you what that is, but maybe I'll find out someday. All right, all right. Uh, someone is having a question about, uh, my question is, does, do statins contribute to liver damage and specifically NF, NAFLD? Well, that's the fatty liver we talked about, <laughs> fatty okay. liver disease. Uh, statins uh, damage the muscles, called rhabdomyolysis. Mm -hmm. And about 5 to 10% of people have uh, obvious pain from that damage. And if you biopsy the muscles of people who do not have pain who are on statins, you can see biochemical and electromicroscopic damage done in 70% of the people on statins. Uh, statins are notorious for raising liver enzymes. And so historically, you know, I haven't reviewed it lately, but uh, you know, I've been taught and have practiced with the idea that statins will damage the liver, but they certainly damage the skeletal muscles. And uh, statins also increase the risk of getting type 2 diabetes by as much as 15%. So they have a warning uh, in uh, the physician's desk reference about an increased risk of diabetes. And statins have been implicated in, you know, other problems like insomnia, depression, cataracts and so on. But I don't think the evidence is high enough to, to really focus on that. I think you should focus on the diabetes risk and the risk of damaging your muscles uh, when you just consider taking statins. And by the way, I do prescribe statins to my very needy patients, those who are at <laughs> high risk of a stroke or heart attack. So right. don't think I throw the baby out with the wash water. I think there's a tiny advantage. And you can read about that in my May 2013 newsletter of taking statins for people, mostly those who are at high risk having a stroke or heart attack. Common citizen. We also should mention we're going to be in Marshall, Texas tomorrow, right? Right. Tomorrow, everyone, we will be... I know there are people here that are going to be there, but remember that I, to, I'm going to be the, the host for the live feed. So if you all want to attend and see Dr. McDougall and his wife, Mary, and his son, Craig, you can actually go to healthfest.com and... It's in Marshall, Texas, health, And I think they still have a few spots. I, I think they're going to have a really good attendance from what I've heard. I know. And, I know. Well, yes. You know, we're going to be there Friday, which is, uh, the, what is it, the 31st Tomorrow. and uh, the, and the 1st of April. Right. So Mary and I will be there. Very good. Mary will be there those days. You will, too. And so I, I hear we'll I AJ will. and a whole bunch of other great people. Okay. Well, I will see you there, then. Okay, good enough, Kasaba. We'll see you there, and thanks for uh, attending the, the webinar. We'll edit uh, some, some of the things out when Gustavo puts it up, and okay. hopefully you'll Very find uh, uh, my few words and Avo's enthusiastic uh, hosting worth your trouble to share with friends and relatives. It's a pleasure. See you all, all, right. see you all this weekend in Texas, or we'll see you next week on the webinar. Thank you. All right. Very good. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.